humans are undoubtedly the dominant species on the planet Earth, and no one's seriously going to argue against that. Having conquered every single landscape and continent they've inhabited for thousands of years now, tens of thousands of years really, it's strange to think that in all that time, all those years, humans had never once been successful in conquering one of the largest land masses the world has yet to offer. It is believed that the first human to ever cross the Antarctic Circle in all of history was only 250 years ago in 1773 when Captain James Cook was on an expedition around Antarctica, but technological limitations barred him from actually spotting the coast. And it wasn't until 1819 that the first human ever saw the landmass with their own eyes after a Russian expedition led by Fabian Gottlieb von Bellingshausen, who was actually an ethnic German born in the Baltic state of Estonia. Because of Antarctica's remote position, treacherous terrain, and unbelievably dry, cold, and barren climate, the entire continent proved to be of very little interest for the Europeans, Americans, or really any other explorers in any other part of the world, which is why it remained untouched by human settlements for centuries. There has never been any indigenous human population in the continent, and one of the first alternate history scenarios that I thought of, well, the first actually, was what Antarctica would look like if it had a native population. And I concluded that the native Fuegian people of the South American island of Tierra del Fuego would have without a doubt been the most likely to survive in such a dreary land, seeing their natural affinity to survive in cold weather, able to fish completely nude in 40 degree waters when most humans would be dead from hypothermia within minutes in the same conditions. Even then, most people don't really realize just how vastly different Antarctica is from any other terrain on Earth, where the very land practically fulminates at the thought of human touch, and Siberia looks like a tropical paradise by comparison. This isn't the Wild West, however, as over the years global geologists, climatologists, and governments alike have unanimously agreed that human settlement in Antarctica could produce adverse consequences that could affect the entire globe, and hence human presence in the region is extremely controlled regulated and sterilized, with a dozen countries ratifying the Antarctic Treaty and 50 more observers around the globe. For this reason, there are no formal countries located in Antarctica today, although you would be gullible to believe the land is unclaimed, as there are seven countries, Argentina, Chile, France, the United Kingdom, Norway, Australia, and New Zealand, that claim various sections of the continent, with many of the claims overlapping with each other, and very few countries outside of this club actually take such claims seriously, and surprisingly, three of the largest countries on Earth, Brazil, Russia, and the United States, have never claimed claimed any land in Antarctica, yet have reserved the right to do so in the future. In reality, these claims are pretty much meaningless, harsh, I know, but true, as the UN doesn't enforce any of these claims, and the population there is so insignificant, it might as well be completely uninhabited. But nevertheless, it is inhabited, as over 30 countries in the world today currently maintain an active base or research station on Antarctica or one of the sub-Antarctic islands. These countries range in diversity from South Korea to South Africa, Peru, Bulgaria, India, and many others you might not expect. Although, for the most part, the continent is dominated by a small handful of countries, notably the United States, Russia, mostly as a relic of Cold War competitiveness, and Argentina and Chile, which makes sense considering that these last two Latin American countries are the closest to Antarctica of any external landmass, only around 500 miles from the South Shetland Islands. These countries have very little regard for international border claims as the 88 bases and stations are scattered throughout the region, although a handful of people have been born on continental Antarctica, which quickly raises the question of citizenship for said newborns. The size of these 88 bases vary dramatically, from the very largest McMurdo Station, which has over 1,200 inhabitants at peak operating months, which would be comparable to a small town, to some bases that are literally just one or two buildings in the middle of nowhere, although at minimum, usually around half a dozen people are stationed at any one area to try and stave off the extreme effects that loneliness and isolation can have on the human mind out there. 
although populations fluctuate between the summer and winter months, which would be reversed for the northern hemisphere, as some stations are virtually abandoned for a long chunk of the year, and even stations that are manned year-round, such as McMurdo, shrink to only a quarter of their peak size. All in all, the total population varies slightly from year to year, but according to most recent estimates, it peaks at nearly 5,000 people in the summer months to perhaps a little more than 1,000 during the winter months, and contrary to popular belief, only around 20 to 30 percent of residents of Antarctica are actually what could be classified as scientists, with the remainder being engineers, construction workers, or other regular civilians who are really no different from your average person of any country. Although the population varies by season, the overall composition actually doesn't seem to change too much, and because there has never been any official census or formal survey of the transient inhabitants of Antarctica, you might think it would be impossible to calculate the demographic makeup of the continent in the same manner of most territories, but there's actually a surprising amount of public information available on Antarctica's populace, along with a few informal methods that I've compiled from a plethora of sources in order to get the most accurate snapshot possible, we can actually calculate the nationality of Antarctic inhabitants to some degree of accuracy, as out of the 4,955 people of the peak population, 29% would hold a European passport, 28% North American, 25% South American, 11% Asian, 6% Oceanian, as in Australia or New Zealand, and only around 2% from Africa, although this doesn't really give a particularly vivid picture. Fascinatingly, although many aspects of government involvement in Antarctica is strictly kept under lock and key, you can easily search for an Antarctic job and even get hired online. And according to simplyhired.com, the average salary of someone stationed in Antarctica is 70425 US dollars a year. And although personal income isn't really synonymous with gross domestic product, it's very correlated, so we can assume the GDP per capita is somewhere around there, which would easily place it in the top 10 richest countries on Earth, or about the same as Norway. In the United States, scientists, on average, have an IQ about 30% higher than the general populace, while for engineers, it's about 25% higher. So by applying this to Antarctica's population, where over three quarters of people are either scientists or engineers, Engineers, the average IQ for the whole of Antarctica would be approximately 120, which would easily make it the highest of any country on Earth, as well as having the most well-educated population. Over 70% of all inhabitants of Antarctica are men, which would give a pretty unbalanced sex ratio, although hey, that's still more balanced than the viewership of this channel, and it's pretty much a fundamental fact of human behavior that men are more likely to be irreligious than women. And according to polls conducted by the Pew Research Center on the general American populace, those with a scientific background are significantly less religious than average, with slightly over half identifying as atheist or irreligious. By creating a rule that scientists are 30% less likely to be religious than average, and men are 5% less religious than average, we can apply this skew to already known religious demographics for the various countries that have nationals stationed in Antarctica with some degree of accuracy. In so doing, we come to the conclusion that somewhere around 40 to 50 percent of Antarctica's population is irreligious, agnostic, or atheist, which does make it one of the most irreligious places in the world, and probably about 48 percent of the population is Christian, 2 percent Jewish, 2 percent Muslim, and another 5 percent practicing another religion. Keep in mind, these estimations could be off by a significant margin because this is pure speculation. And who knows, maybe there could be something about being stationed at the very edge of the world itself that increases or decreases someone's faith in a higher power. English, Spanish, and Russian are the most commonly spoken languages in Antarctica right now, and seeing how the majority of Antarctic inhabitants are well-educated, we can only assume that even most nationals from a non-Anglo country have at least some proficiency in the English language. Now, racial and ethnic makeup is one factor that is far less predictable. However, simply by looking at official statistics released by the American Census Bureau and the United States Department of Education, we're able to come to a few conclusions. 
According to the National Science Foundation, in 2008, roughly 78% of those graduating with a degree in science, engineering, or technology were white, a category which includes those of Jewish and Middle Eastern descent, with another 15% of Asian descent, which again includes those of East, Southeast, or South Asian origin, and 7% were Black, Latino, or some other race. A more recent study also found that in the United States, yeah, white males, and especially Asian males, were far overrepresented in the current workforce of the STEM population, and this is even true for a country like South Africa. So applying this skew on what we already know of the Antarctic population, those of European descent most likely make up around two-thirds of the continent's transient population, while those of Asian origin are one-sixth the population, and the remainder is African, Middle Eastern, or non-white Latinos, such as Chilean or Argentine mestizos. It doesn't look like the population of Antarctica is going to be given any significant boost soon, nor will the political status of the continent be undergoing any significant changes. It would be pretty much impossible to survive a subsistence lifestyle in Antarctica because, as I'm sure you can guess, farming would be near impossible on a large scale and only possible on a smaller scale in a greenhouse of sorts. And even then, it's illegal to introduce invasive species in Antarctica. And you can't hunt because there are absolutely no guns allowed in Antarctica and you aren't even allowed to interfere with the wildlife anyways. You can't even legally step on some of the fauna. And in the end, I would guess nothing short of a nuclear holocaust or zombie apocalypse would kickstart any mass human migration to this perpetual no man's land. But I'll go ahead and leave you guys a poll in the top right asking you if you would ever have any interest in moving to Antarctica. It really is telling that the general public is more excited about colonizing other planets that don't even have an atmosphere before even considering touching Antarctica, which is on our own planet. You don't need to travel to space to get to it, and you don't even need to terraform it. Please let me know your thoughts on the continent of Antarctica and all the mysteries that surround it, as well as my estimates and whether you think they're accurate or not. Maybe one of the few people that have ever been stationed in or have visited Antarctica could tell their experiences. And as always, thank you all for watching. This has been Mason, and uh, don't fall off the edge, guys.